Greetings friends, welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We continue today with the message which we brought to you last week from 1 John chapter 5. And we start reading again here in uh, verse 1 through verse 7 where it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Friends, we're speaking to you of the subject of the Trinity of God. The Trinity which is spoken of here, the Father, the Word, which we know is Jesus Christ, that Word which became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And thirdly, the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. These three, the scriptures say, are one. One God, but three persons, three faces, as you were, three faces of God, the three persons of God, <coughs> the three personalities, but they are three distinct, separate persons of the Godhead that we will show you in these coming weeks the distinction between these three things. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit does not speak of itself. But it shows us our Lord and our Savior. And our Lord and Savior is the one who has shown us the Father. That's the order of their revelation unto us. So we are following in that order. We're speaking of the Holy Spirit. And we showed you from the Old Testament <coughs> references there of the Holy Spirit of God. And we began in Matthew and working our way through the Gospels. We're in the Gospel of Luke now. Gospel of Luke chapter 1 verse 41 is our next scripture text. Here where it says, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. When Elizabeth heard Mary's salutation, her declaring unto her that she had been chosen by God to bring forth the Savior, the Messiah, into this world. That Holy Spirit of God came upon Elizabeth and filled her up, and not just her, my friends, but also that child within her, that baby, by the name of John. Filled him up too, and he leapt for joy, for he heard he heard the declaration that the Son of God would come in through Mary, and he leapt for joy. Hear these things. We move on down to verse 67 in Luke chapter 1, where it says here, and speaking of Zacharias, And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Zacharias is filled up, that Holy Ghost fills him up. And he begins to declare, he begins to prophesy these things. And he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. That being a reference to prophecy that would be fulfilled. And here Zacharias is prophesying, he is declaring that God has fulfilled his word, he's fulfilled prophecy, and the horn of salvation 
is coming forth out of the house of his servant David. Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. Here it declares and says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord or the Lord's Christ. Now understand here, it's being specific. That, and we'll see, we see this in what the Bible teaches us of the Holy Spirit. That of the Godhead, of the three persons of the Godhead, it is the Holy Spirit's work to give us understanding and reveal things unto us. Not the Lord's, not the Father's, but the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that is within us and dwells within us. And leads us, my friends, unto all truth and teaches us the Word of God. It causes us to see and understand, to hear even, the Word of God, which is declared and set before us. That Holy Spirit of God caused him to understand. It revealed unto him that he would see the Lord's Christ. He would see the Messiah, the, Messiah, the Savior, while he yet lived in these latter days of his life. And he did. Luke chapter 3 and verse 22, and it says, And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape, like a dove, upon him, and a voice came down from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Now we'll refer to this verse at each one of the three persons. For we have all three of the persons of the Trinity listed here. That Holy Ghost descends in the shape of a dove, showing itself as a separate entity, a separate person, you might say, from the Lord himself, who's just come up out of the water, the Messiah, who is God with us, and we hear that voice of God the Father decree from heaven thou, that this is his beloved Son, in whom he's well pleased. Or it states it here that thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. States it both ways. And many times we have that relationship shown forth. We'll see that uh, relationship both when we deal with the Son of God and with the Father. Now, moving on, Luke chapter 4, starting at verse 18, declares unto us, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he, this is Christ declaring that the Spirit of the Lord is with me. That Spirit of the Lord, that Holy Spirit, is with him, even in his work. And it, you know, the, the Godhead works in unison to bring about the will of God in, its, in the unity of God. Uh, we don't have one part of the Godhead uh, working to bring something to pass, and other parts of the Godhead then being uh, neutral in the matter, not working positively or even negatively in regard to the matter. But the whole Godhead works to bring about the desire of the Godhead that all things according to the will of God might be brought to pass in this present life. John chapter 3 and verse 7. He says here, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou Hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And that Spirit, like before, is capitalized here. It lets us know it's referring to the Spirit of God. Even that Holy Spirit of God, 
which like the wind that one can feel the presence of the wind when you're standing outside. You can feel it and you can see the presence of it in the motion of the grass round about you in the fields or in your yard. You can see the motion of the leaves and the limbs and the trees and the bushes and it tells you that the wind is present and the wind at times can pick things up and move them and you can see the presence of the wind. And at times wind will pick up that which we would call smoke and move it or dust. You can see the presence of the wind. You can feel the presence of the wind. But the wind itself, my friends, is invisible. We cannot see it with the naked eye. We can see the effects of it. We can hear the rushing of a mighty wind. Oh, at times during a storm, when storms are moving in, you can be in your house and you'll hear the wind as it's rushing around your house or your abode. You can hear the effects of that wind. And the same is true, my friends, in regard to the Holy Spirit of God. That is what Christ is comparing it to here. The working of that Holy Spirit is like the wind. And let me say to you, who can say to the wind, don't blow on me. Who can say to the wind, no, I don't want to feel your presence. I don't want to see your work. I don't want to hear your work. Who can say to the wind that? It would be in vain. You can spit in the wind, but it's going to come right back at you. You can speak to the wind and say, I don't want you in my life. But you can't stop the wind. You can't stop the wind from affecting everything round about you. Especially when it's silent and you don't see anything moving. You don't see anything moving on the ground or in the trees. You don't see anything in the air moving. But yet you know it's there. So is the Holy Spirit of God that is present in our lives. In the days before we came to be born again, as he's speaking of here, from that point before you were born again, that Holy Spirit was always present round about you, my friends. And I'd have you to understand that the Godhead was watching over you, preserving your life. And the very fact that you're saved is evidence of that. But how so? How so? The fact that you're saved is evidence that you're a child of God. And that God had predetermined before that day to save you. He had predetermined before the day of your physical birth to save you spiritually. That's being born again. He had predetermined for your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and any of those generations ever came together going all the way back to Adam himself. He had determined to save a people for his namesake out of his creation because before the foundation of the world, my friends, he knew, he knew that man would fall from that perfect state where God made him to be. God did not create this world in the condition, my friends, that it is in now. This sinful condition, this the sin is destroying man and it's destroying this very world. Yeah, I'd say it's destroying even the heavens themselves. It all will and must be destroyed before the end. But that Holy Spirit of God and the Godhead were in unison before that very event of you being born again. They were there watching over you and controlling the events that brought down through the ages so that the right sets of people came together so you would have that mother and father who came together to conceive you and to bring you into this life, and God watched over the hands of the doctors, the physicians, and those that tended to your medical needs. And he's kept you alive to that very point in time where now you've been born again by the power and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, which you, after hearing the Word of God, you must needs hear the Word of God. 
And after that seed has been sown in the air, it's taken root, and it's waiting on the Holy Spirit of God then to come and water it and to quicken you, and in that very moment, pricking your heart, giving you faith, so you have faith and repentance together, coming together, bringing you unto Christ at the very same moment. All by the working and the power of the Holy Spirit of God, He's revealed unto you your lost, undone, sinful condition, your need of salvation, and He's revealed unto you your Lord and Savior who was lifted up before you on a cross there and suffered and died in your stead, in your place, suffering your penalty of sin, that is, under the penalty of sin, you must die. You must suffer death, and you still will die physically. But you will not die the second death. You will not suffer the second death. He's already endured that for you, and he was victorious over it. He was victorious over death, hell, and the grave for each and every one of those who will believe. My friends, if you apply that to the wicked who are going to hell, then Christ is unrighteous. God is unrighteous, for he cannot require payment twice for what's been paid. He has to save those that were given to him because he has paid their debt. He has redeemed us from all our sins, even our sins of unbelief. And if he didn't pay for that sin on the cross of Calvary, he didn't pay for any of them for you. No, not a one. You have not forgiveness. If Christ did not die for you on the cross of Calvary, the Holy Spirit of God is the one who reveals all these things unto us. The Holy Spirit of God is that thing which is present there in our natural birth, watching over us, making all things go according to the purpose of God. And it is there... Fulfilling that second birth, that spiritual birth, being born again of the Spirit. First time by the water and that natural birth. The second time is by the Spirit of God and that spiritual birth. Now some will say, well, no, that water is baptism. No, it's not. No, it's not. Not at all. That would be a work. That would be something you actually have to go out and physically participate in. That Jesus Christ who came by water and blood, that's talking about that natural birth. And we too had a natural birth, just as everyone that came after Adam and Eve. All the descendants of Adam and Eve have had that natural birth. We weren't created out of the dust of the earth like they were, or actually like Adam was. And then Eve, he took a set of ribs from Adam and created Eve. She wasn't formed from the dust of the earth like we are, or like man. There's a distinction there, my friends. She was created specifically for the man to be that proper helpmate for him because there was not anything else found in creation for him to be his helpmate. No, not the monkeys, not the apes, not any of those kind of things like some falsely perceive and believe. And we're getting a little off the subject here. We need to get back to this. This Holy Spirit of God who is the one who quickens and makes us alive. Moving on to John chapter 7 and verse 39, we read, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. And the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Speaking of that comforter, that he would send to them another comforter. The Lord Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, the Christ, the Son, the, the only begotten Son of God. We, we must be specific on that. He's not just the Son of God. He is the only begotten Son of God. And he was there as the comforter amongst the disciples, the twelve, and those others, also the seventy, and all those 120-some names by the day, on the day of Pentecost are recorded. And he was there with them just days before. And yeah, we're talking about even after he's glorified here. But even at that point, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given. What does that mean? Does that mean the Holy Spirit wasn't in them? No, not at all. The Holy Spirit is within all those who have been, been quickened and made alive. It just takes a little dab. 
just the little presence of that Holy Spirit within you to quicken you and make you alive. And His presence is always with you. He abides with you. But He's the Lord's with them. They don't need the Holy Spirit yet. They have the Son of God right in their midst. The Son of God is there with them and ministering unto them, teaching them and telling them about all these things, telling them about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter that He's going to send, this other Comforter, telling them about His Father that's in heaven and how that all this is according to the will of the Father. The Trinity. We're talking about the Trinity. And this first person of the Godhead, as we're speaking of it here, now some may put it in the other order and say the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, because that's, you know, because that's order of baptism. And whether you would say it's the first or the third, this is the silent member of the Godhead who does not speak of himself, the Holy Spirit of God. He's saying that he would send that other comforter, that Holy Ghost, that Holy Spirit, would come after he went up. And they were to wait for it. Who was to wait for it now? That first church of Jerusalem. That church which the Lord built himself, which did not exist prior to the Lord coming. It's an assembly. He assembled together a people, and again, that's another matter. But that's who he's speaking to here. He's speaking to this people, this group of people, which he has gathered together. First the twelve, and then he added seventy more, and sent them all out two by two. So that by the day of Pentecost, scriptures record it's 120 some odd names, roughly 120 names roughly. That it speaks of there being 120 members of that first church at Jerusalem who has all the authority it needs to go forth and now, not just Israel, but in all the world and preach the gospel following the leadership of who? They're waiting for leadership. They're waiting for the promise to be fulfilled of the other comforter, the other person of the Godhead who is that Holy Spirit, who we will see throughout scriptures leading his people at Jerusalem, that first church at Jerusalem. We'll see that Holy Spirit leading them as they choose deacons. We'll see that Holy Spirit leading them as they lay hands on men like Saul, who would be called Paul, and others, dude, laying hands on them, anointing them with authority, and, uh, sending, and giving them authority, from God through his church at Jerusalem to go out and to preach the gospel and do missionary work. These things we'll see as we go on. Going on now to the 14th chapter of John. Starting in verse 15 we read, it says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. That Holy Spirit of God abiding with his people forever. And that is even, even of the end, even when we're in that new heaven and earth, that Holy Spirit's going to be with us. Comforting and guiding us, leading us according to the what? Not our will. You could say the will of the Lord, but I think the Lord would say it's according to the will of the Father. Again, distinguishing the Trinity. and But it is also according to the Lord in the sense that it's by His Word, the Word of God. This is what the Holy Spirit speaks to us of. It shows us, it gives us understanding of this which is before us. And once we're enlightened, once we're saved, my friends, before you were saved, I believe this specifically, that you must hear the Word of God preached. You must hear the Gospel preached audibly with a voice of somebody. It could be on a recording. It could be by somebody just happenstance. You hear somebody speak of Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Maybe they're witnessing somebody else nearby and you hear it. But you must hear the Word of God before you can believe. How else can you call upon somebody whom you've not heard of, the Scripture says. And it is by this Word of God then that the Holy Spirit can take and will begin to show us and teach us by the Word of God the things of God. Not by the traditions of men or all the philosophies of all the great men of the past or even of the today if there, if there even be any 
but by the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will teach and show us by the Word of God what the will of the Father is in our life and how that we're to hear His Son and to believe Him and to believe the witness of God the Father and God the Son and of the Holy Spirit in regards to all these things. The Godhead working in perfect unity to reveal unto us and magnify God the Son and the Father. He said, I'll send unto you another comfort. And verse 17 says, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. The world doesn't see the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God is truth. His word is truth. There are, and it's all connected, showing us the same things. They do not speak differently one of another. He goes on to say, Neither knowing, uh, neither knoweth him, can't see the Holy Spirit, and doesn't know, the world doesn't know the Holy Spirit, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now take note of that. Holy, the Comforter hasn't been sent yet. But he says, but you know him. You, to you, my people, you disciples, you twelve and you seventy. Except for one, of course. Judas was chosen to betray him. And that we could say that 120 some names were members of that first church on the day of Pentecost. Already, he's saying to them, you know the Holy Spirit, and he dwelleth within you. He's already in you, and he shall, and you, and shall be in you, and shall be in you. He was already present in those who were saved and believed and following the Lord, for it's through that working Holy Spirit that they saw Jesus and believed upon him. But that Holy Spirit would fill them up on the day of Pentecost, and it would be, all right, fellas, all right, brothers and sisters of faith, you disciples of the Lord, it's time to go. It's time to start. It's time to start the crusade, as it were. And it's not a crusade like the Roman Catholics went forth with sword and shield to conquer, but it was a shield with a sword of the Word of God and the shield of faith going forth to slay the lost hearts of men and to pierce their cold, stony hearts with the preaching of the gospel and to save them by the power of God and the preaching of the word of God that they might see Jesus. And it is that Holy Spirit, my friends, that showed them Jesus Christ and quickened them, made them alive and co convicted them of their sinfulness that they desired to repent unto God and said, Men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? They wanted to be saved. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Saying unto them that he would not leave them comfortless. He was with them. And he said, I'm going to send you the comfort. The Holy Spirit is going to be with you. He's going to lead and guide you. And you'll know what to do because he's going to lead you to do those things which according to the word of God. Oh, my friends, there are many in this world today that are led by different spirits. But they're not led by the Spirit of God. My friends, we're quickly running out of time here again. And we pray God will bless you and bless his word. That he'll use this study in the sense that it is. We are studying upon the Trinity of God. That God who is one but yet has three persons. <coughs> and this is in a sense it's hard to comprehend how he can be one but yet three. But yet it's clearly stated that there are three in heaven who bear record. And those three are one. May God bless you, my friends, and keep you. Be looking up for our Lord is returning.